Amen. All right, now Genesis chapter 19. Very famous chapter in the Bible. Unfortunately, it's not famous enough these days. I think there's a lot of pastors, a lot of preachers that fail to teach on such a foundational and such, a, such an important um, story from the Bible in Genesis chapter 19. Of course, last week in Genesis chapter 18, we saw the angels. They came. Abraham met them and he, he served them and he, you know, he made uh, a meal for them and made them sit down and everything. And what they were doing is they were on their way to Sodom. They were on their way to make sure you know, that because they had done very wickedly in the sight of the Lord. They had done um, very wicked things. You know, it was... It was not just, it wasn't just a regular sinful city like all sinful cities are. This city was given over and God wanted to send his angels to say, let's see how bad this really is. Let's see if what I'm hearing about this place is really true. So these angels were passing through and they meet up with Abraham on their way to Sodom. Abraham, you know, takes care of them. And then, and then Abraham pleads with God saying, look, you know, if there's 40 people, if there's 30 people, you know, he goes down to 10 people. Like if there's 10 righteous people, are you going to spare the city? And God said he would spare it. But now we're in chapter 19, and we see the angels, they finally arrive at Sodom. Right? It says in verse 1, And there came two angels at so to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground, and he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early and go on your way. And they said, nay, but we will abide in the street all night. Now here we see Lot, similar to, to Abraham, being hospitable, saying, hey, you know, he sees him in the way. Come on into my house. You know, come wash your feet. Relax. I'll make you something to eat. You know, spend the night and then you can be on your way in the morning. And um, now it's not exactly the same. We see Lot here makes them unleavened bread, whereas Abraham's like killing the fatted calf. He's got... Uh, Sarah making him food, and he goes and he waits on him. But we still see some hospitality out of Lot, and um, you know he he wants these guys to come say. And they said, you know, these angels come in, they're like, no, you know, like that's okay. We'll just we'll just hang out in the street all night. You know, we'll, we'll just camp outside. We'll camp out here. We'll be just fine. But Lot presses them. He urges them, like, no, no, come on. I can't let you stay out here. You know, come into my house. So then he finally they finally agree to go into Lot's house. So let's see where we're at. Verse number three. It says, And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and entered into his house, and he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. Okay, so they're eating, they're having a good time, they're enjoying themselves inside Lot's house. Look at verse number four. It says, But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. So Lot's house gets surrounded from basically, essentially, all of the men of the city. They come out. They come out of the work. It says from every quarter. From every corner of that city, there's, there's these men all come out. And look at what it says here. Both old and young. This isn't just one group. One, you know, like middle-aged men. No. The old, the young, all these men. This is why the angels have come to destroy this city. Because there weren't even 10 righteous there. The old with the young. And this will tell us a lot. Now listen, we need, if we want to know anything about a subject, if we want to learn about, fill in the blank, whatever it may be, about this life and about you know, sins, about things that we should do, whatever, whatever the topic is, all of the answers are contained in the Bible. This is an extremely important passage because it deals with queers. It deals with homosexuals. And this is a huge issue in our country today because we have gotten so permissive and tolerant and accepting of homosexuals because people don't understand what they are really all about and what they are like on the inside and who they really are. We have this false concept that they're, well, they're just like you and me, except when they're in the bedroom, they do something else with, you know, with someone of the same gender. But that is not true. That is not the only difference between the sodomite and any other normal person. And we're going to see these attributes. First of all, you see the both old and young because they start off predatory 
attacking the young children, the unstable souls, as you'll see in Jude and 2 Peter chapter 2 that describe the reprobates because that's what sodomites are. They are reprobate. They are rejected of God. And I, I'm, I'm kind of laying a lot out here. I'm not going to get in to prove everything. I've done it in other sermons. But what I want to focus on here are a lot of these attributes that you see of sodomites. And I'll tell you what, the, one of the reasons why this is so important is because we still use the term sodomy or sodomite even today in 2015. Now, it's less common, it's less known, but it has been used, I mean, for the past 2,000 years, or at least in English language, it's been used, you know, for the past 400 years to describe these people. And why is it used? Why is someone called a sodomite? It's because they are of Sodom. Now, it's impossible for someone to be a true sodomite today because Sodom doesn't exist as it did in this story. God rained fire and brimstone down and destroyed it. So when, he talk, when we see sodomites or references to sodomites in the Bible, obviously it's talking about this type of person. You are just like the men and women that were in Sodom at this time. And we see right here in verse number four, what do they do? They surround Lot's house. They see, oh, here's some fresh meat. Hey, here's two guys that we don't know. We want to know them. And when they say, they say um, in verse 5, And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. Now, the Bible is not very graphic and it's not, uh, um, you know, it's, it's very uh, safe for, for children's ears. And for our ears, you know, we ought not to be getting into too much detail. So the Bible will use euphemisms and things like this to, to help us to understand what they're talking about without just explicitly coming right out and saying something filthy because the Bible is not filthy. Every word of God is pure. But when it says here they want to know them, we see the reference back with Adam and Eve when it says Adam knew his wife and she bare a son. That's the type of knowing. It's not like they wanted to come in and, and have coffee with these angels and get to know them and talk to them about their travels. That's not what they're talking about. They wanted to brutally force them into their wickedness. It's what they want to do. And we see it's both old and young, and they came from everywhere, and they surround, there's this big mob of sodomites outside of Lot's house. So when people use that word homophobic, oh, are you afraid of homos? Well, yeah, because this is what they're like. They're fierce. They're incontinent. They're haters of God. Now, am I personally just afraid of the homos? No, but if, if you're in Lot's shoes, you can see a very good reason to be afraid of these people, right? Because they're there to do harm. And that's what sodomites are all about. This is what we could learn from the Bible. And there's only a few stories that deal with homosexuals, with the fags. There's only a few chapters that will deal with this. So we need to get what we could learn from Scripture about this. Because if there was other attributes about them, the Bible will tell us about that. But there's not. Look at what, um, verse number 6. Let's keep reading here. The Bible says, And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. So Lot goes out there and tries to, tries to calm them down, right? He steps out the front door, he shuts the door, and he's like, look guys, he said, look brethren, and he's calling them brethren, right? A bunch of sodomites, he's saying, look brethren, <laughs> And we're going to learn a lot about Lot in this story too because Lot was a very worldly, carnal Christian. He was not serving the Lord. He was not out soul winning. He was not doing what's right. And, and we're going to get into that as we get into this story a little bit because there's a lot of things that we can learn about Lot. And I'll tell you what, our Christianity today is filled with a bunch of Lots. And when you have Christianity that's full of a bunch of Lots, you're going to get a bunch of sinking sodomites just multiplying all around you. When you got a bunch of lots filling up the pews that say, oh, come on in, homos, you're welcome here. What's going to happen? We see what happens because we see what they're really all about. He says, do not so wickedly. Now, lots solution. I want to I make sure this is clear too because a lot of Bible mockers will point to this. 
and say, oh yeah, see, as if, as if Lot's the shining example of how a Christian ought to behave. They'll point to the story and say like, well, yeah, the Bible teaches that you should just give your virgin daughters unto these guys that wanted to rape the angels. Like, no, that's not what the Bible teaches. That's what Lot was trying to do. Because he was saying, look, don't do so wickedly. Don't be so wicked to these men. It was better in Lot's mind for, for them to have their way at least with women if they are completely insatiable, if they are completely unsatisfied and they won't leave until something happens, he says, at least it's better if you do this with women than if you do this with men. That was his thinking. Now, was it right for him to even offer up his children? No, of course not. He should have defended his house and defended, you know, and, and prayed unto God for deliverance as well. And, and you know, not even offered up his own children, his own daughters. But this is, this is Lot, right? This is what actually happened. This is what he did. Now, it doesn't make it right. It doesn't mean that's how you ought to deal with this situation. But what he was trying to do is pick the lesser of two evils. Because that would have been the lesser of two evils. Now, think of, and think about that. Think about how extremely wicked it would be for two virgins to be defiled by a mob full of men. At least in this country today, I think everybody would say that is horrible, despicable. Those guys deserve to be put to death. Yet, when we see the same thing happening, you know, an even worse event with, with the angels that came in, people seem to be tolerant of the homosexual lifestyle. And it's just fine. No, it's wicked. It's extremely wicked. It's way worse. It's, it's worse than even a gang of men forcing themselves on women. It's worse than that for a gang of men forcing themselves on a man. And you know what? They know it. They know that they're filthy. The sodomite today knows that he's just a filthy animal. That's why they have so many suicides. That's why they're always depressed because they know that they're just a stinking animal inside. They have no peace. They have no comfort. And we see here that they even know in this story. Look at verse number nine. Because Lot comes out there and says, look, guys, don't do so wickedly. I'll give you my daughters. You know, just, just do unto them whatever it is that you want to do. But don't do so wickedly to this guy. Look at what they say in verse number nine. And they said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came into sojourn and he will need to be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them? So did they know that what they were doing was bad? Obviously, they said, because we're going to deal worse with you than we thought to do unto them. We already planned and intended on doing bad things to these people because we're a bunch of stinking sodomites, but now we're going to do even worse to you for standing up against us and trying to get us not to do that. This is what the sodomite is truly all about. This is why I get so upset about the stinking sodomites and the gay pride and, the, and this whole world just going to garbage and tolerating this, this, this stuff because this is what it's going to be. This is what it's going to lead to. This is what you have to look forward to when you allow this stuff to happen and you allow this to become rampant because it spreads like a cancer. It spread throughout the entire city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Both of those cities, it's spread throughout both of them. And this is interesting too because there's nothing new under the sun. You know, this, this fellow, this guy here came to sojourn. And sojourn means he's, he's just, you know, he just came here to, to stay temporarily. He's just visiting. You know, this guy came to sojourn with us and he will need to be a judge. Like, who are you to judge? Judge not, judge not. That's what the homos will all say today. Oh, I thought you're not supposed to judge. And they'll read Matthew chapter 7 where it says judge not and then period and as opposed to reading the whole rest of the, the chapter and the whole rest of the passage that talks about judging and not being a hypocrite. But we are to judge. But this is, this is exactly what they'll say. They'll say, oh, don't judge me. Right? This is the attitude of the sodomite. It hasn't changed. This is exactly what they did to Lot. Oh, he's going to need to be a judge over us. Now we're going to deal worse with you than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. So this mob just kind of rushes in on him. And you got a bunch of people pushing from the back. So they're, they're pushing up against him to the point where he's like ready to break the door of his house open. Verse number 10. 
But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut to the door. So those angels that were in there, they grab them, they get them inside, and they shut the door again. They, they save them from this angry mob. Verse number 11. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. And this shows you how, how rabid they are. The angels blind them. They're all blind. They can't see anything. Now, if you just got struck with blindness, wouldn't you be like way more focused on the fact that, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, hold on a second. I can't see. You know, I need to get home. I need to take care of this and, and start trying to feel your way around just, just to, to take care of this blindness that came on you all of a sudden. But that's not what they did. Look what it says. It says, verse 11, it says, they smote the house... Uh, the, uh, at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find. They're still trying to find the door. They're out there blind, just trying to be like, we're going to get these guys. They're stopping at nothing because they're driven by their, their insatiable lusts in their heart and they're given over to a reprobate mind and they're acting like an animal because that's what they are. As natural brute beasts will see that a little bit later in the sermon. So you know, oh, I, don't I don't like the fact that you're calling them animals. I don't like you calling them, you know, just hold on a minute. We're going to get to that point in a little bit and I'm going to prove to you from the Bible why I'm calling them animals. Because that's exactly what they are and that's how the Bible describes them. But let's keep reading in this story. Verse number 12, And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters and whatsoever thou hast in the city? Bring them out of this place, for we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. Look at this. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. Now, why do you think it is that his sons-in-law didn't take him seriously? They thought, oh, he's just mocking. He's just joking. He's just kidding. He's not serious about that. Because Lot was the watered-down Christian. Lot never talked about God's anger, God's fierceness, God's wrath. And again, today, we have all these Christians, oh, don't focus on God, you know, God's just love and God's just this and God's just that. Instead of going into no, let's look at all aspects of God. That way, when you talk about God, when something like this is going to happen, people aren't going to think you're just a big joke. People actually listen to what you have to say. Lot was just one big joke. He never taught about God's wrath, God's judgment, God's punishment. No one was getting saved. How are you going to get people saved if they don't even realize they're in, they're, they've got a problem? They've got a sin problem that they're headed, they're destined towards hell. You don't ever talk about hell. Why, would he, why in the world would anyone even take him seriously? Because they didn't. His own sons-in-law, I mean, people that was part of his family, didn't take him seriously, thought he was just mocking. Never taught about God's wrath. He lived in a wicked city. He was impacted by the wicked city. He probably never spoke a word against the Sodomites until that time when they're banging on his door and trying to get those men. That's probably the first time he even spoke up against it. And you know what? By that time, when you have a mob outside of your house, it's too late. That's why we need more voices today kicking and screaming and yelling against these stinking sodomites before they just get bigger and bigger and, and get to the point to where, oh, now maybe I should say something about it. No, Christian, you need to be talking up, speaking up about it now and sounding out like, sound a voice like a trumpet, as the Bible says. And... Um, you know, preaching on the housetops about this subject because it is getting progressively worse and worse every day in this company, in this country. Excuse me. Let's keep reading. Look at verse number 15. Actually, I'm going to get back to this. Because I want you to see, now, now we're getting out, I mean, this, this entire story, this, this is what happened with, with the Sodomites, right? They compass out the house roundabout, and they're demanding to have these men to know them, and they'll stop at nothing. 
essentially, you know, at the rest of this, God destroys a city, and then we see other things that happen with Lot and his daughters. Let's look at Judges 19, because Judges 19 is another story where that's very. Look at it. We're going to see a lot of similarities in the story between Genesis 19 and Judges 19. You will see the blaring similarities because it's the truth. Because this is what the Sodomites are all about. This is who they are as a rejected, a reprobate from God. When, when their minds have been given over unto a reprobate mind, these are the, the attributes they possess. Look at verse number 17 of Judges 19. So we're going to see a similar thing. Remember, they, Lot saw the angels come into town, right? And he, and he said, wait, you know, come into my house. Don't stay in the street. Don't stay out here. Come into my house. I'll take care of you. And then the men of the city surrounded the house. And we know the rest of the story. Look at verse number 17. Look at all of the, the blaring similarities. It's not by coincidence. God's repeating this for us so we could understand and learn what they're all about. Look at verse 17. And when he had lifted up his eyes, he saw a wayfaring man in the street of the city and the old man said, Whither goest thou, and whence comest thou? And he said unto him, We are passing from Bethlehem, Judah, toward the side of Mount Ephraim. From thence am I, and I went to Bethlehem, Judah, but I am now going to the house of the Lord. And there is no man that receiveth me to a house. So we see this guy, he's, he's traveling. He's just traveling through town, as the angels were. He sees this old man. He's coming in from work. He had a hard day's work. He's coming into town, and he's like, you know, he starts talking to this guy. He's like, look, we've got everything we need, but nobody's, nobody's taking us in. You know, there's, there, no one's going to let us stay with them. You know, we're, we're not going to be a burden on you. Just, just we're looking for a place to stay. He says, no man receiveth me to house. Verse 19, yet there is both straw and provender for our asses, and there is bread and wine also for me and for thy handmaid, and for the young man which is with thy servants. There is no want of anything. And the old man said, Peace be with thee, howsoever, let all thy wants lie upon me, only lodge not in the street. Just like Lot, he doesn't want them staying outside, he doesn't want them staying in the street because he knows how wicked it is. Verse number um, 21, So he brought him into his house and gave provender under the asses, and they washed their feet and did eat and drink. Right? This guy's being hospital to him, just like Lot was. They're sitting down, they're having a meal, they're enjoying themselves getting refreshed. Verse 22, Now as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, certain sons of Belial, now it calls them sons of the devil, because that's who Belial is. It is a false god. It's Satan. Sons of Belial beset the house round about and beat at the door and spake to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring forth the man that came into thine house, look at this, that we may know him. Now, were they, the guy came in, okay, here's the story. This guy came in with his servant and a concubine, which is kind of like his wife, but not like legitimate wife, right? He has this, this, this concubine, this, this, you know, this, this wife, whatever I call her, a woman, and they, who are they interested in? The man. Turn around. They're interested in man. Why? That we may know him. It's the exact same thing they said, and they're just coming right out with it, saying, you know what? Bring that guy out here. We want to know him. Look how this man responds. Verse 23, And the man, the master of the house, went out unto them and said unto them, Nay, my brethren, nay, I pray you, do not so wickedly. Same exact thing that Lot said. Seeing that this man is coming to my house, do not this folly. Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. Them I will bring out now and humble ye them and do with them what seemeth good unto you, but unto this man do not so vile a thing. And we see this guy, same situation like Lot. He's doing the same thing. He's trying to appease them with these women. The only difference is in this case, they end up taking him up on it. Look at what it says in verse 25. But the men would not hearken to him. At first, they're not even listening to him. They're saying, I'm not, no, no, that's not what we want. So the man took his concubine and brought her forth unto them, so basically, like, they didn't want that. But this guy just takes his concubine and throws her out there. Like, you know, this is too much for me. Which, again, horrible thing to do. Not the right thing to do. What a, what a wicked thing to do. To, to, I mean, and, but, you know, this, this should also be a warning to, to women that just want to be a concubine instead of doing the right thing and getting married to somebody. 
This is how much that guy is going to care about you, right? I mean, this guy went seeking her, wanted her to come back and stuff. But when push came to shove, you know, he wasn't willing to lay down his life for her, which is the way that a husband ought to be towards his wife, as, you know, as Christ did for the church, as we see in Ephesians chapter 5. He didn't have that, that feeling toward his wife. That's what he should have had. You can't look at these stories and say, oh, well, that's what he did, so it must have been the right thing. No, that's just what the Bible's recording what happened. This took place. It doesn't mean that it's right, that, the way that he responded. But, the, but look at what we see with these people, these, these animals, because that's what they are, is animals. So the man took his concubine and brought her forth unto them, and they knew her and abused her all the night until the morning, and when the day began to spring, they let her go. Just like cockroaches, the, the, the day starts to light, they don't want the, the light to shine on their evil deeds. They go scurrying away after they've abused this woman all night. Verse 26, Then came the woman in the dawning of the day and fell down at the door of the man's house where her Lord was till it was light. And her Lord rose up in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way. And behold, the woman, his concubine, was fallen down at the door of the house and her hands were upon the threshold. And he said unto her, Up, and let us be going. But none answered. Then the man took her up upon an ass and the man rose up and got him unto his place. These stories make me physically ill to my stomach. Every time I read them, it doesn't get any better. I don't like hearing these things and hearing these stories. It's not pleasant. But just because it's not pleasant doesn't mean we should just avoid it and stick our heads in the sand and pretend like it doesn't exist. We need to confront these issues. This is what the sodomite is today. This is who they are. This is what they are like. They raped this woman and abused her until she died to death. No regard, no respect for human life, for human dignity, for anything. They just used her like a rag doll and abused her. And you know what? They would have done the same thing to the guy. They don't care because they're animals. No normal person can do something like this. You have to have a reprobate mind in order to even accomplish doing something like this. We all have consciences. Their conscience is seared with a hot iron. They don't even see it as bad. They know that it's bad, but they don't have the internal God to stop them from doing these things. No normal person can go through with something like this. They're reprobate. They're rejected. We have to get that through our heads. That's the only way these people are able to even carry out such heinous acts. Turn, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter number 2. You say, oh, we're just looking at all this Old Testament. You know, this is just the Old Testament. You know, why don't you look at the New Testament? We are going to look at the New Testament. I'm not even going to go to Romans 1. If you want to know more in the, in, in the New Testament, go and read Romans 1, and you'll see the entire list that are of attributes of the reprobate, of those that are rejected of God. They're haters of God, despiteful, proud, inventors of evil things. Look, all of these things are what sodomites are. They're proud. They glory in their shame. But the New Testament, 2 Peter chapter 2, explains that we need what we need to learn from Sodom and War. Hey, we're reading Genesis 19 in our Bible study tonight. Let's see what 2 Peter 2 tells us that we can learn from this story in the New Testament as New Testament believers. Look at verse number 6. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live. Un this is the New Testament, folks. The New Testament is saying, yeah, what God did in the Old Testament, let that be an example unto you. This is how God's going to deal with that wickedness. God didn't change his mind about it. God didn't just say, oh, you know, look, and think about this. How long-suffering, how merciful is the Lord God in heaven? He is slow to anger. He is slow to wrath. He gives chances. He gives opportunities. But when God has gotten to the point where enough is enough, and he says, look, 
this is horrible. This city just needs to be destroyed. There is no hope for it. And what I will do is save the righteous out from among the wicked and destroy this city. And he says, this is an example. God hasn't changed his mind about the homos today in 2015. He still feels the exact same way. This is the judgment that they deserve. Look at verse number 7. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. The Sodomites have filthy conversations. If you've ever been around them, you know that to be true. You know they don't speak clean things. They speak vile, disgusting, perverted things. They have a filthy mouth. And it vexes. And if you're saved, you know, it ought to vex your soul too. You ought not to want to be around that and to hear that and to take pleasure in that or take enjoyment in that or satisfaction in that. Look at verse number 8. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Verse number 9. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly... Them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Now listen, we're talking about the same group here because we're going to keep on reading. It's talking about the same group of people. Verse number, look, they're presumptuous. They're self-willed. They only think about themselves. They're proud. They're arrogant. They're haughty. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignities. They're not afraid to speak evil of the Lord God or the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number 11, Whereas angels, which are greater in power, might bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord, but these, as natural brute beasts. Brute means stupid, and beast means an animal. These people, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed. Speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. The, the people of so the Sodomites that God overthrew their land. The Bible calls them 2 Peter 2, chapter, verse 12, natural brute beasts, stupid animals that are made to be taken and destroyed. That's what they are. So don't get angry when I call them animals because that's exactly what they are. That's what the Bible calls them Stupid animals that are made to be taken and, put to, and, and, and destroyed. Just like the, the, the bad dog, and the Bible actually refers to sodomites as dogs. We're going to see that too. Actually, turn if you would to Deuteronomy chapter number 23, because we'll see that here. The Bible refers to sodomites as dogs. When you got a bad dog, when a dog goes after someone and they bite a person and they've got that taste of blood, they turn into a bad dog and the only thing you can do with that dog is put them down. They have to be put down. They have to be killed because there's no hope for that dog anymore. The same way you put down a, a, a bad animal like that, he's saying that's what the sodomites are like. They're beyond repair. They are rejected. But I'm going to keep, you're, you're, stick in Deuteronomy 23. I'm going to keep reading 2 Peter chapter 2 because it said, we said, um, while they feast with you. you know, we have to be aware of this because these wicked people will be around you. Verse 12, 14 continues on saying, having eyes full of adultery and cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable. So look at this, more attributes. Their eyes are full of adultery. They're always, and adultery too, right? Don't tell me, oh, that guy's married. He's not a homo. Yes, he is. The men of Sodom were married. They had children. They have eyes full of adultery. It says here they cannot cease from sin. Now look, we're sinners, but you are not on a 24-7 sin fest all the time. The Bible says that they cannot cease from sin. They are always, they're, they're just, they're so corrupt 
and perverted that they're always saying their eyes are just full of adultery they cannot cease from sin they beguile unstable souls who's more of an unstable soul than a young child they trick them they beguile them they 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 get them in and they abuse them and it says in heart they have exercised with covetous practices cursed children that's why they're children of the devil sit up they're children of the devil because they're cursed children. We're blessed children. We're children of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're children of God the Father. Once you are born again, no one else can be your father but the Father that's in heaven. When you're born of the devil, it's the same way. When you become a son of Satan, a son of Belial, a son of the devil, that's your daddy. That's your spiritual daddy. You're your cursed child. You live out the rest of eternity being cursed it says, verse 15, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Now, I had you turn to Deuteronomy chapter 23. Look at verse number 17. The Bible says, There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore or the price of a dog into the house of the Lord thy God for any vow, for even both these are abomination unto the Lord thy God. So we saw in verse 17, he says, a whore or a sodomite. In verse 18, he says, a whore or a dog. Referring to sodomites as dogs. First Kings, we see a few examples of, a righteous, of two righteous kings and you know, how they dealt with sodomites. We see the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. We read it in Genesis 19. We saw the other example in Judges 19 of these Sodomites that, that, that did exactly the same thing, right? But other than that, you're not going to find the word homosexual. You're not going to find, you know, queer other than the fact that they go after strange flesh, which is why we call them queer, because queer means strange. But you'll see a few reference to Sodomites. And we see in 1 Kings 14, and again, if we're, if we're going to look at all the references to understand, how does God feel about this? What does the Bible teach us about these people? 1 Kings 14, verse 24, it says, And there were also Sodomites in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. So again, when you look at those, those lists of sins and the things in Leviticus 18, 19, 20, you start looking at that stuff and be like, you know, they talk about bestiality and all these other weird things. That's what the Sodomites do. They do all of these things. They're abominations. They did according to all the abominations. Says, look, th this is what the Sodomites are. This is who they are. Okay? We're getting the same picture from every chapter, from every place in the Bible that refers to them. It's the same thing. This is who they are. We have to get this through our minds and not be brainwashed by the television. Not be brainwashed by the music industry. Don't let them get into your head and say, well, they're really not that bad. They're really okay. No, they're not. This is who they are. Look at 1 Kings chapter 15 because that, that first, uh, uh, chapter 14 explains there were Sodomites in the land. They did all these abominations that uh, the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. 1 Kings 15, verse 11 says, And Asa, this is one of the kings of Israel, said, And Asa did that which was, or the king of Judah, did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David his father. And he took away the Sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. So what was, what was Asa did? What did he do that was right? He says, look, first verse it says, he did right in God's eyes. The very next verse, he took the Sodomites out of the land. Seems to tell me that the thing to do is to get the Sodomites out. Kick them out. They're not welcome here. They're a cancer. They're not welcome in our society. Get them out of here. That's doing right in the eyes of the Lord. 1 Kings 22, verse 45 says, Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat and his might that he showed and how he warred, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And the remnant of the Sodomites, so the Sodomites that were just left over after Asa had gotten rid of them, the, 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 the few stragglers that were still in the land, says, And the remnant of the Sodomites, which remained in the days of his father Asa, he took out of land. So Jehoshaphat finished the job. He's like, wait, there's still some stinging Sodomites around here. We're going to get them out. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. This is what the Bible teaches about the homos. 
And so many people get offended at this preaching. So many people are offended and say, oh, you know, why do you have to call them beasts? Why do you have to call them names? Look, because you have gotten, so, you know, people get offended when you say the word faggot. Now, it didn't used to be that way. I remember growing up as a child 30 years ago. We call people faggot all the time. And it, was, and it was not something you wanted to be called. It was something you just called someone else. But it wasn't looked down on. Like, oh, don't say it. Now people are like, oh, don't say that. Oh, no, we can't. That might offend somebody. Oh, that might offend this queer little, little guy over here that, that's, you know, limping his wrist and, and you know, we, don't, we can't offend him. That is the, the, the change just in a few decades in this country. It used to be a normal thing to have a derogatory term like faggot not be a big deal to hear. But now so many people have just have been brainwashed. And that's what we're trying to combat. That's why I use the words I do. Because look at, look at the stories in the Bible. Look at what the Bible describes them as. Don't let anyone trick you into thinking that they're, they're not like this because they are. Otherwise, God's word is wrong. Let's go back to Genesis 19. We'll finish up this story. We're going to see some more. Because... We have a, we're, we've got a country that's filling up with sodomites and we also have a country that's filling up with lots. Christians that are just like Lot. And, and the two seem to go hand in hand. You're going to abound with more sodomites the more lots that you have. We need more Abrahams. So they warn them in verse 17. They're saying... And, and, you know, I don't get this either. Lot is lingering around. Like, this event just happened. These guys are trying to, to rape him. They said, we're going to do worse unto you. They, they surrounded his house. And they practically got him. And the angel's like, look, we need to get out of here. Get your family and let's go. We're destroying this place. And he's still fumbling around. He's moving around. He's getting things together or whatever he's doing. Look at verse number 16. Or verse 15, it says, And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy look. He, he waited all the way till, till dawn, getting his act together. I don't know about you, but I'd want to get out of there. Forget the stupid stuff and leave, man. That's dangerous. You know, but here he is. He's still trying to get his act together. The angels hasten Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife, thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. So why is it taking him so long? And, and I believe we can at least learn something symbolic of this. When you have a real, when you're a real worldly Christian, and, and just really far away from serving God, and you're living, you're carnal, you're living in the flesh, it can be difficult sometimes. I think there, you, know, you often want to kind of stay as carnal. And you, you, know, and, and you could be afraid. You don't want to, to take that step and actually start losing some of the sin that's in your life. And we see that here with Lot, how he's like, he just wants to kind of stay behind and just get his last little bit of that, that wicked society before, before leaving. And um, you know, it's, it could be hard for a carnal Christian to forsake the world. Because that's what God's calling us to do. He wants you to be a peculiar people. He wants you to be different from the world. He doesn't want you to do everything that they do. He doesn't want you to have the same entertainment, the same values, and the same everything else that the world does. He wants you to be different. So you need to get a lot of sin, a lot of junk out of your life. And that's not always easy to do. And sometimes you want to cling to certain sins in your life. And I think that's symbolic of what Lot was doing here. Verse number 16, it says, And while he lingered, so he's still lingering around. The guys are like, look, get out of here. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand to grab him. Like, look, you're coming with us. And upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. They had to literally drag him out of there. Don't be a lot. Don't be someone that has to be drugged like kicking and screaming out of the city that's about to be destroyed. Get real, man. You don't want to be around that wrath. Don't be around it. Don't surround yourself with the wicked people of this world and just, and just be right in the middle of that and be okay with that. I mean, Lot had his house. He didn't start off in Sodom. He moved to Sodom. And he stayed in Sodom 
And he practically didn't even get out in time, even being warned and knowing about it. They had to drag him out. Now look, another point. God was so merciful unto Lot. Lot is, and we're going to see as the story finishes, Lot is not the shining example of a Christian. But look at God's mercy. Even when he's dragging his feet and they literally have to take hold on him and drag him out, the, the, the length that God goes through. I mean, God sends these angels to his house to get him out of there. God goes through these lengths because of his mercy. What does that tell you about the men of Sodom? He didn't do that to anybody else. He burned them with fire and brimstone. Keep reading. Verse number 17. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad, they said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee. Neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. He's saying, don't look back. You need to get out of here. You need to forget these things. And, and don't look back. Don't have, don't have any remorse for these people. Don't worry about these people. You just need to keep, just move ahead with your life. You need to move forward and get right with God and don't look back to your sinful past. But, of course, his wife decides to look back. Look at verse number um, 18. It says, And Lot said unto them, O oh, oh not so, my Lord, behold now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life, and I cannot escape to the mountain lest some evil take me and I die. Behold now, this city is near to flee unto and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. It is, not, is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And he said unto them, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city for the which thou hast spoken. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah, and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. Right? Just instantly just, just died and became a pillar of salt from looking back. And the land of Sodom and Gomorrah became, you know, when he rained fire and brimstone down, the, when, uh, and I'm not going to get too, too much into salt in the Bible, but there's a few uses for salt um, one is, you know, it's like a preservative, but another one is it is more commonly used as, um, you know, we hear in the New Testament that we're the salt of the earth. And salt is used for seasoning, for flavor, right? To, to make things taste better. And that's the reference of salt there. But then the other use for salt that we, we can find in the Bible is for destruction. We just, you dump a bunch of salt on the ground, it, it, it taints the ground, it ruins the ground to be able to grow on it. And it'll destroy that, that land. And, um, I believe what we see here with, with Lot's wife is that last use of when I mean, she became that destruction. She looked back and her heart wanted to stay back with, with, the, with Sodom. And they told her, that, you know, don't look back. But she did. But, um, you know, it's also, we see another attribute of Lot, his, his total lack of faith. Because what does he say? He said, look, you guys have already, you know, you've already shown mercy on me. I know you're going to show mercy on me again. Like, I can't go to the mountains. Like it's just too far. Something bad's going to happen to me. Some evil is going to fall me. Just let me go into this city. And to me, it's kind of like, what's the nerve of this guy? You know, like you see all this stuff happening and they're saving you out of this place. And you're going to like talk back and ask to, to go to this other city. But they hearkened unto him. They listened to him. And, you know, we ought, we ought to kind of keep that in mind too, how much God listens to prayers and he answers prayers. Lot requested to you know, to, to go, to not to have to go all the way to the mountains, but go to the city, and they listened unto him. Now, he still ended up going to the mountains because God did end up overthrowing Zoar and those other cities that were around about. But, um, but for the time being, he was safe in that city. Let's keep reading. Look at verse number 27. And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where the, he stood before the Lord. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. And you got to wonder what's going on in Abraham's mind because he just pleaded with God. He, he tried to intercede. He tried to do what, you know, he tried to, God, look, like, 
You're not gonna you're not gonna destroy it for you know for all, he, he bargains with them, he's pleading with them, trying to get them not to destroy it. Ten people was all he looked all he needed. And Abraham woke up, he looked out there and he saw the smoke like furnace. He know he knew what happened. He must be thinking, wow, it's not even ten people are saved in that city. Not even ten. It's sad. All the more reason why we need to be going out and, and doing our job and not be like a lot who didn't do his job at all. And it got to that, to that point of depravity. Verse number 29, And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in the which Lot dwelt. So we see here, God remembered Abraham and that's why he saved Lot. That's a pretty powerful testimony too because he told him to go to the mountains and he said, okay, fine, you could stay here. But he ended up overthrowing those other, because those other cities were wicked as well. And he ended up overthrowing them. But because he remembered Abraham, Lot was rescued once again. Lot seems to, you ought to be very thankful that he's got an uncle like Abraham. Because he's, he's gotten him out of a lot of messes. You think about that. And you know who should you be surrounding yourself with? If you surround yourself with the most godly person you could think of, I mean, you're a lot more likely to have good things happen to you, even if it's for their sakes, right? And you think about if you can be that much more godly of a person, you strive to be like an Abraham. You could have this impact on other people as well, where God will look well at others for your sake, because you're doing what's right. This is what we want to do. This is how we want to be. Look at verse number 30. And Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain and his two daughters with him, for he feared to dwell in Zoar and he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. And the firstborn said unto the younger, Our father is old and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine and we will lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father. Again, another very wicked thing that these, these daughters of Lot do. They think that like, they're like, the whole world's just destroyed. Like God's just destroyed everybody and the only people are left. It's kind of a stupid thing to think, but they're like, it's just us left here. You know, just so that we can procreate, we need to have children by our father. But we know that dad's not going not gonna to be for that. So we just need to get him drunk and take advantage of him. And that's exactly what happened. And, and again, what's Lot doing getting drunk? What's Lot doing when the cities are overthrown, making sure he's got booze with him? in the first place. They go to live in a mountain. They're going into a cave. And they're like, let's make sure we got enough booze so we get liquored up. But they had it. Come, let us make our father drink wine and we will lie with him that we may pres preserve seed of our father. Verse 33. And they made their father drink wine that night and the firstborn went in and lay with her father and he perceived not when she lay down nor when she rose. Look at how drunk he got. He was passed out cold. Now, hopefully you've never been in a state like that before. But you've got to be pretty drunk, pretty intoxicated to get to the point to where you are passed out and you have no idea what's going on around you. But again, all the more reason, girls, listen up, to never touch alcohol. Never drink it. Never let anyone talk you into it. Never let anyone say, oh, this is just fun. Oh, we're going to have a lot of fun. And you see people and they act stupid. And what happens is, and we see throughout the Bible, I preached on this before too, I preach on alcohol, is that time after time after time, people get taken advantage of and bad things will happen to you when you drink alcohol. And that's exactly what happened to Lot. He had no idea what was going on around him. None. But it gets worse. So they do that one night. Then it says, third, verse 34, And it came to pass on the morrow, so the next day, that the firstborn said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesterday night with my father. Let us make him drink wine this night also, and go thou in and lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him. And he perceived not when she lay down nor when she arose. Two nights in a row, Lot's getting so drunk that he's passing out and has no idea what's happening. Now, he should have known after the first night that something had happened to him. 
Even after he woke up, he didn't know when they laid down and got up, but he should have known that something happened to him. But he just, let's let it happen again. These are the attributes of Lot. Okay, Lot is not the shining example of a Christian. Yet Lot is the way that way too many Christians are today because they are not founded in Scripture, because they say things like, oh, you read the Old Testament, oh, you think we should follow the Old Testament rules? Yeah, God was so mean in the Old Testament. We're free. We're free from that law. We're free in grace, so we don't need to worry about any of that stuff. No. We're free in Jesus Christ from the curse of the law of hell, yes. But it does not mean that we can just continue to sin. What? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. And what is sin but the transgression of the law? God forbid that we would continue in sin, which means we need to keep the law. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not grievous. We need to make sure that we are right with God. Don't get this permissive attitude and thinking that, that everything's just fine and be this lot type of a Christian who's afraid to speak about the judgment of God, afraid to talk about the wrath. So when the wrath is actually upon him and he actually has an opportunity to save somebody's life, they don't take him seriously because his testimony is shot and it's ruined. Don't let that happen to your, to your testimony. Don't let people look at you and when you finally have an opportunity to give them the gospel, when you finally have an opportunity to get somebody saved that you actually care about your own family, that they don't just look at you and mock and think you're mocking and, and joking and kidding around about hell. Oh, pff, hell, yeah, what's this guy talking about? I've seen the way he lives. This guy's getting drunk every night. He's going to tell me about hell? Yeah, there's judgment coming? Okay, whatever. And you know what? That's the way that I used to live my life. I used to be that lot. Getting passed out drunk. And it's a shame. It's a shame. And it ruins your testimony. You're not going to be able to do anything for God. Strive to be an Abraham. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this chapter. And... Um, for these stories, these warnings about the Sodomites. I pray that you would please just help us to, to wake more people up regarding this issue. Help us to be vocal and um, not to back down or, or get scared, but to stand firm in your words and to preach the truth, dear Lord, so that other people can be warned because these people are out to destroy lives. They ruin lives. They destroy. They go after these children, dear Lord, and they go after other people. They go after unstable souls, whether they're children or not. We know the truth because you've given it unto us, dear Lord. Without your word, we would be ignorant of a lot of these things. But thank you, Lord, for enlightening us on this issue. I pray that you would please help us to never go soft and to, and to strive to be Christians the way that Abraham was where you had respect unto Abraham and um, he, was, he was considered your friend, dear Lord. We love you and it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.